In this video, we'll look at the Heathkit XR1 transistor portable radio. The transistor, invented in 1947, started the solid state revolution, which led to today's miniaturized, low power, solid state electronic components that made possible devices such as computers and smartphones. The first commercially manufactured transistor radio was the Regency TR1, introduced in 1954 using transistors from Texas Instruments. The XR1, the subject of this video, was the Heathkit Company's first transistorized radio, previous models having used vacuum tubes. Introduced in 1957, the XR1 utilizes six Texas Instruments germanium transistors and operated from six 1.5-volt D cells, often referred to as flashlight batteries. It's housed in a case of light blue vacuum-formed plastic. It sold in the U.S. for $29.95, which, taking inflation into account, is equivalent to about $280 in 2021. Features touted in the Heathkit catalogs included six name-brand Texas Instruments transistors plus two diodes, a 4x6-inch speaker, long battery life of 500 to 1,000 hours, and an unbreakable molded plastic cabinet with formed-in handle. It covers the standard AM broadcast band and weighs about 4.75 pounds with batteries. It was sold only as a kit of parts that the user had to assemble. Relatively complex, it uses all point-to-point -point wiring, but the detailed Heathkit instruction manual meant that just about anyone should have been able to build it without any more equipment than a soldering iron and some basic tools. The circuits, IF transformers, were pre-aligned so the user didn't require any test equipment. You could optionally touch up the alignment using a provided alignment tool without needing any other instruments. The following year, 1958, it was updated to the XR1 PL and XR1 L models. Utilizing the same circuit, the XR1 PL at 2995 had a slightly restyled hard plastic case in two-tone blue. The XR1 L, $5 more expensive at 3495, had a leather case. You could buy the plastic model and then later buy just the leather case at a cost of $6.95 and install the chassis in it. In 1960, it was replaced by the similar XR2PL and XR2L models that had a slightly different plastic or leather case and vernier tuning. Heathquit subsequently sold many models of AM transistor radios over the following decades. The unit has very simple controls, one knob for on-off and volume and another for tuning. There's no tone control, external antenna connection or headphone jack. The opening at the top of the case functions as a carrying handle. The approximate tuning frequency is shown on the knob. Tuning is a little tricky as the knob has only a half turn of rotation for the entire AM band. The later XR2 model added vernier tuning. Rated at 50 milliwatts, it produces decent volume and good quality sound from the 5x7 inch speaker and with intermittent use would typically run for months on a set of batteries. Now would be different, so Biden's maiden address there was interesting. He, um, he talked about relentless diplomacy, uh, basically saying America's back, we're willing to lead. Don't care, don't pay there. I had all the Calgary gear handed out years and years ago, and I thought I was going to go. The back is made from wood and comes off with four screws. The chassis comes out of the case by removing the knobs and two more screws and carefully prying it out. Inside the plastic case, circuitry is on a metal chassis and uses point-to-point -point wiring. Visible are the tuning capacitor, three IF transformers, two audio transformers, volume and power control, and the back of the speaker. At the top is the large ferrite rod antenna coil. Six D cells are housed in a battery compartment at the bottom. A label inside shows the battery placement and transistor types and locations. 
The six germanium transistors are installed in sockets, something that was common in early transistor radios when the reliability of transistors was not well known and it was felt like vacuum tubes that they may occasionally require replacement. It also avoided overheating them during soldering. It's a superhead design with a 455 kHz IF frequency. The transistor types used are 12N252, 12N253, 12N254, 12N238, and 22N235. Germanium transistors are now rarely used and most today are silicon. Removing the speaker grill and speaker, you can see the point-to-point -point wiring, which is relatively complicated, but is widely spaced out and easy to get at. This radio was bought on Kijiji, what eBay classifieds is known as in Canada, from a seller in Ottawa. It was complete and not too bad cosmetically. The knobs had a powdery white mold that seems to grow on some old plastic. The back is marked VE3ALK, which is an Ontario amateur radio license. And a sticker on the back says, Inspected Baggage, Bahamas Custom Service. More on that later. I couldn't find a full manual as a free download on the internet, but I did find a schematic and alignment information which was adequate for my needs. Full printed manuals are available for purchase from a number of sources. I gave the unit a visual inspection and a light cleaning. The cushioning material for the battery holder had started to disintegrate, but it's not really needed and was discarded. I slowly powered the radio up with a power supply and it was working and picked up all the local AM radio stations. I tested the value and ESR of all the electrolytic capacitors as they're prone to failure. One 100 microfarad cap in the auto amplifier was bad. Replacing it significantly increased the volume level. The other electrolytic caps were okay. I touched up the IF transformer and tuning capacitor alignment following the steps in the manual. At this point it was working well and needed no further restoration. Out of curiosity I did some research into who might have owned this radio. The ham radio call sign written on the back is currently assigned to someone in Perry Sound, Ontario, but a check of an old call book from the 1970s listed as Dr. J. M. Morton in Ottawa, which is the city where I bought the radio. A Google search listed him as a member of the Ottawa Amateur Radio Club in 1974, an obituary that appears to be the same person appeared in 2016 and indicated that he was a scientist that worked for the National Research Council in Ottawa and was an avid yachtsman and a member of a local sailing club. This would indicate that Dr. Morton was likely a PhD and not a medical doctor. Regarding the sticker on the back, I found references to the same type of sticker in various places on the internet, including one that was up for auction with some memorabilia collected by a diplomat at a summit between U.S. President John F. Kennedy and the British Prime Minister in 1962. That indicates that the sticker would have been from this time period. With a little poetic license, I can imagine that the scientist Dr. Morton bought the radio kit in 1958 and assembled it. He could have taken it on a trip to the Bahamas circa 1962, possibly sailing there on his yacht, where the radio was inspected by the local customs officials. He left the sticker on as a memento of the trip. I can imagine he used the radio for some years before it became outdated and put in a basement where it got a little moldy. When he passed away, it was purchased in an estate sale and someone in Ottawa resold it to me on Kijiji. The XR1 was Heathkit's first transistorized radio. It was distinguished from some of the other early transistor radios on the market by its use of high quality transistors, large speaker, use of standard flashlight batteries, durable cabinet, large ferrite rod antenna, and good audio output using a Class B output amplifier. It's a testament to those early germanium transistors that they're still working after over 60 years. Even though this was early in the transistor era, this was a well-performing radio that a non-technical person could build themselves from a kit. It still works as a basic AM radio today.